We will get started. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Assembly Member Rebecca Bauer Cahan, and I want to thank you for joining us tonight to talk about COVID-19 and the vaccines that have arrived. I'm happy to be joined tonight by my colleague in the State Senate, Senator Glazer, and two incredible doctors, one from Contra Costa Department of Health and the other from UC Berkeley, our neighbor and amazing institution of knowledge to talk about these vaccines. It is a good week. The vaccines have arrived here in Contra Costa and some people have received them. I actually was speaking earlier in the week with one of the senior officials at Contra Costa County Health who was telling me the most heartwarming story that at the beginning of this pandemic, she walked into a room with leaders from the ICUs throughout the county and she realized that the chit chat in the room was about their wills and whether or not they would make it through this pandemic. And this week, we gave those same doctors the vaccine. So it is a corner that we have turned in just nine months. And I know I am so grateful to every single person that made it possible to have a vaccine in a historically quick amount of time, um, whether it was the scientists who created the vaccine, the brave individuals who are willing to be part of the studies that made it possible, those in the government that made it happen as quickly as they did and made sure distribution was as smooth as it was this week. So we are here, but it, we need to talk about what that means. So that's what we're going to do tonight. I know many of you have questions. We got a lot of questions before the town hall, and we will answer as many of them as we can. There's also a Q&A feature for those who have additional questions, which my staff will either respond to or we'll try to get to tonight as part of the discussion. We'll be talking about the efficacy of the vaccines, how safe they are, how we got to where we are, as well as how they will be distributed in the county. But before we begin, I want to introduce my partner in the legislature, our wonderful Senator Steve Glazer, and let him have a few, few moments for opening remarks. Senator? Thank you, Assemblywoman, and, and thank you so much for your partnership and leadership on this issue and so many other issues that we are working on together uh, in the legislature. I'm mindful that those who are watching or listening today are doing so under very, very difficult circumstances, personally, professionally. Uh, many have lost their jobs. Many have businesses that have been forced to close. And so these circumstances are unprecedented in our lifetime. And I know how difficult it has been and it will be over the next uh, few weeks and a few months as these vaccines roll out. So I just wanna say that my office and I know Assemblywoman, your office, we're available to help wherever we can um, and uh, provide the information as you are doing in this uh, town hall tonight uh, so that people can be informed, make smart decisions uh, to keep us all safe. And so I thank you again uh, for your leadership on this. And I look forward to the questions and the, uh, the conversation tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. And um, to your point, we have worked hard throughout this pandemic to provide, even despite the trying circumstances in which we have to do so, to provide the best and most accurate information to our shared constituents through town halls. And those are on our websites. So you can go to Senator Glazer's website and my website and find the town halls we've done. Um, both of us, they've been on subjects such as how to get that unemployment insurance, small business relief, um, helping our students through distance learning, mental health, and the like. So those are all available to you as well. And I want to share in the Senator's statements that we know how hard this has been, which is why the relief that came this week in the first wave of vaccines is so welcome. And we're just hopeful that we will get to the other side of this and recover and be stronger and save more lives. That's the key to be healthy and to save our constituents' lives. So thank you, Senator. Um, and now I want to introduce our two experts who are here to answer your questions. So first, we have Dr. Sarah Stanley, who's an associate professor at UC Berkeley in infectious disease and vaccinology. I think I said that right. Okay. She's an infectious disease expert who had studied the live COVID-19 virus in her lab. Welcome, Dr. Stanley. Thank you very much, Assemblywoman. It's really nice to be here tonight. And in addition to Dr. Stanley, we have Dr. Svielli, a deputy health officer for the Contra Costa County. Dr. Svielli, I know you have been on the front lines responding to and mitigating the pandemic since the very beginning. Um, you've been on some of our town halls as we've talked about the way this pandemic has affected us and how to stay safe. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. So we are going to start with you. We're gonna get right into it, Dr. Stanley, with the questions we have on this subject. So. As I mentioned in my introduction, the vaccines came out surprisingly fast, and I believe in a historic timeline, if I'm correct. Can you tell us a bit about that process for testing and approving the vaccines? I know there are some out there for whom it makes them nervous how quickly this happened. Yeah, um, so these vaccines, although um, 
you know, everything happened on a really unprecedented kind of timeline in terms of how long it usually takes to make a vaccine, these vaccines still did go through the normal steps um, of evaluating any vaccine or drug um, that's going to be given, you know, to patients. And so what that means is that these vaccines, before they're approved by the FDA, will go through clinical trials. Um, and so in the first phase of clinical trials, they'll be tested on a small number of healthy volunteers to make sure they don't cause any adverse effects. Then they will be tested on a slightly larger group of people so that we can start to get a sense for the efficacy of the vaccine. So that means, is it going to work and is it safe? And then um, these vaccines then were tested in large phase three clinical trials that uh, consist of tens of thousands of people. So you get a really nice picture of how well the vaccine works at preventing COVID-19 and also how safe the vaccine is. And is that, does that look like it usually looks when you study a vaccine? Yeah, so actually, although the process was fast, um, the steps were really pretty um, standard for what a, a normal vaccine would go through. And part of the reason why things went so fast is, well, one, people already knew a lot about coronaviruses, even if not a lot about this coronavirus. Um, and then two, some of the regulatory steps, which could take a longer time, um, were, were kind of um, ru uh, not rushed, but were um, accelerated um, for this vaccine process. And then three, there was just a lot of funding and a lot of um, you know, people who were invested in making this happen quickly. And then four, actually, I think in a way, we, we are, we're very lucky that these vaccines have good efficacy um, and that they were able to clearly show that in the phase three clinical trials. And it's, I think I read somewhere that the, the basis of these vaccines, how they were created is decades old. And that was part of why we were able to get to where we are so quickly. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So actually for, um, for two of the uh, vaccines, the technology is new in terms of how the vaccine is made. Um, but the end, at the end of the day, vaccines all do the same thing. So they try to expose you to the, um, the virus in a weakened form, in a dead form, or just a piece of the virus. And then that causes your body to make an immune response. Um, and then, um, you know, hopefully it works well enough that when the real virus comes along, you're protected. Um, so the thing that we did know for coronavirus vaccines is sort of which piece of the virus was going to be most likely to um, create a successful protective immune response. And so people really exploited that knowledge for making these vaccines really quickly. Interesting. Well, thank you for that. Um, and Dr. Cielli, can you talk about, um, people are asking when they are going to be able to get vaccinated. So can you talk a little bit about vaccine distribution in our healthcare system, how it'll be distributed and prioritized to various populations? Sure. Um, and thank you again for the invitation. So uh, the vaccine is prioritized in um, basically five phases. Phases. Their, their labels are 1A, 1B, 1C, and then phase two and phase three. So we are right now at the very beginning of phase 1A, and the um, intended recipients in phase 1A are healthcare personnel and residents of long-term care facilities, um, like nursing homes, assisted living facilities. Um, within this phase 1A, there are some sub-tiers, uh, which I don't need to get into now unless people have further questions about that. And then just uh, today, the committee that advises the CDC on who should be in phase 1B weighed in just this afternoon. And they said that those people should be essential workers, like uh, people in the education sector, food and agricultural se sector, police, firefighters, um, uh, transportation sector folks, as well as adults over the age of 75. Uh, initially, the recommendation had been to only do the essential workers, but there was a recognition that um, the most mortality, most people are dying, are the elderly. So they added in uh, folks over the age of 75. Between those two groups, it's about 50 million people. And um, they are expecting enough vaccine to vaccinate that phase 1B, everyone in that phase 1B, by the end of February, at least for the first dose. Um, and then there will be a phase 1C, which is uh, adults with high risk medical conditions and uh, other adults over age 65. 
And then finally, we'll move on to phase two, which is children and young adults, um, 30 years and younger, and um, critical workers that were not covered in phases one and two. And then the last phase will be phase three. By that time, we expect to have plenty of vaccine around, and uh, that would be everyone else in the United States. So that's the description of the phases. Um, about when, e when does each phase uh, start or even sub-tier within each phase really depends on how much vaccine we have coming in. So we had the first um, 9,000 plus doses come in last week. We're expecting another, um, I think, close to 20,000 uh, doses coming in this week. And those numbers should continue to roll in week by week. Uh, now we have two approved vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna, and we have some of both of those coming in. Interesting. So we got a couple. So while we're on that, I will, we got some specific questions from constituents about their circumstances. So the first is from um, Young Wang Ding in Dublin. So he says, I'm 86 years old and he's wondering when the vaccine will be available for him. So did I hear correctly that for someone who is over 75, you anticipate by the end of February, they'll get the first dose? Correct. And how will they know, how do we know yet how it will be distributed once it's, I mean, right now it's very limited who it's going to, right? People who work in healthcare facilities and those that live in senior living facilities. Once we get to the general population for those over 75 or essential workers, do you know how it will be distributed? We're still working that out. Um, what the state has figured out is that they're, get, they're, they're taking all of the vaccine that they're getting from the federal government, and then they're taking some off the top for healthcare providers that function in more than one county, like, like the Kaisers and Sutters of the world. And then the rest they send to the counties and the counties really get to distribute it and figure out a distribution system. And each county is doing it differently. Um, in our county, we anticipate having some mass vaccination sites and we'll be um, advertising those about when and where they are on um, coronavirus.cchealth.org slash forward slash vaccine. And you can keep checking there. Um, we'll also probably be using our partners. So the Kaiser Sutter John Muir Network of Care should also have some vaccination sites um, along the way, and we're in active discussions with them, signing contracts, identifying spaces, um, identifying personnel, because it's really the same people who do healthcare in the hospital, the clinic, and the testing sites that would be doing this too. So recruiting personnel, getting volunteers, re-signing personnel, it's a big logistical operation. That is for sure. Um... And I know that you, I believe the county has been doing some flu vaccinations, sort of as a test run of those vaccination procedures, which is good to know you're getting ready. Yeah. So Violet Moore from Livermore asks, she has a pre-existing lung condition. So um, she's concerned about her well-being and is wondering when those, now if she's over 75 from what you said, she'll be in 1B. What about those with pre-existing conditions who are under 75? So the, I, I believe those are in phase two. Uh, so, no, sorry, 1C, phase 1C. Um, so we don't know exactly when that will start, but if I had to give an estimate, I would say probably uh, March, April. Okay. Um, and then we got a question from Sarah Lind, which is a question that I've been getting a lot about our educators. Obviously, people are very eager to get our students back into school. Um, you and I are both parents. We know how important it is to have our kids in the classroom learning. So um, educators are in that 1B category as well. So they will be vaccinated by the end of February, according to that timeline as well, right? That's what we anticipate, exactly. Right. Yeah, and I know that I was on a call just on Friday um, advocating for our schools. Uh, and I know the state was in the process of prioritizing 1B and they also said that um, teachers were likely to be up there with other critical essential workers. So I think we're optimistic that they will be um, in that second wave after we get our frontline healthcare workers who have truly been um, facing COVID every day and the seniors who are most at risk in our um, congregate care facilities vaccinated. So that's helpful to know. Um, yeah, the, the, just to clarify for those who don't know the process fully, the, the federal government, the CDC makes a set of recommendations of who should be in which tier. Then the state weighs in and has a California specific recommendations. 
And then the counties weigh in and we have our own uh, ethical and equitable allocation committee that is already looking at how many doses are coming in and when we should open up which sub tier. So um, the decisions, the recommendations come from the federal government to the state and then that are, are ultimately made at the local level. Yeah, um, well, thank you. And I know that, um, you know, from everything I've heard from our work together that you really are focused on equity and um, saving the most number of lives. And so those who are most at risk are going first and, and it will follow, so thank you. Um, okay, Dr. Stanley, a question for you. So I understand there are three main types of COVID-19 vaccines. Can you talk about the three types of vaccines, how they work, how they'll be administered, one dose, two dose, et cetera, and whether they are equally as effective? Should people have a preference between the three? Sure, yeah. Um, and if I, if I get a little too technical, feel free to interrupt me and ask me to um, clarify. So as I mentioned, the way that a vaccine works is that um, you take a piece of the virus and you generate an immune response um, to the virus. And so what you're look really looking for is to make an immune response that will block the ability of the virus to get into your cells um, where it needs to be in order to grow. Um, and so there, the, three, the three types of vaccines that are under development right now are the kind of um, dominant ones are, the, are just three different ways of kind of getting a piece of the virus into you in order for your immune response to be generated against that. And so all, um, all three types in general are um, trying to generate immune response against a protein on the kind of the surface of the virus called the spike protein. And that protein is necessary to enter into your cells. So the, the three types of delivery methods are, um, first is the mRNA vaccine. So the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, which are both approved are both mRNA vaccines. Um, and so what that vaccine does is it takes advantage of the fact that your cells will take RNAs, your cells make RNAs all the time. That's how they make the proteins you know, that you need in your cells and in your body. Um, and so what they do is they take an mRNA that is going to make your cells make this virus protein spike. Um, and then because that's not a normal protein in your body, you'll get an immune response to it. Um, and so now what we know is that um, those vaccines are very um, efficacious. The other types of vaccines are you could just take that spike protein, make it in a lab, and then use that um, as a vaccine to get your, again, to get your immune response to generate um, an antibody that will block that spike protein. And then the third way is a viral vector vaccine. Um, and that is where you take a, um, a different virus that doesn't really, that doesn't make you sick, um, but will infect you and um, express proteins. And then you sort of trick it into making the spike protein. Um, so all three are just ways of getting the spike protein in so that you can generate an immune response um, and an antibody uh, to block the virus when the real virus tries to come in and infect you. And so um, right now, uh, I guess I should start by saying, you know, just from the beginning at the outset, we really still don't have a way to predict which method is going to be the most effective. And so we really still have to just try, you know, do these clinical trials and um, test them and see, you know, which ones, which ones are the most effective. And so Again, the two vaccines that are approved in the United States are both mRNA vaccines, and they were both very effective. Both of them um, were shown to be greater than 90% effective in blocking COVID-19 infection. And um, there is another vaccine um, made by AstraZeneca and a group at Oxford um, in the UK that is also very advanced in um, clinical trials, and that is a viral vector vaccine. However, that one, um, for reasons that aren't totally clear, that one doesn't seem to be as effective. So for the two vaccines that are currently, you know, approved in the United States, I would say they're both effective, they're both great, um, and there really isn't a reason to prefer one over the other. And they're both two-dose vaccines, right? They're both two-dose vaccines, yes. Got it. Um, so that's important because we need to make sure that if we get people the first dose, we follow. Gotta get the second dose, yeah. And the second dose should be of the same kind that the first dose was. So you're not, as of now, we, we don't know what mixing them would do, but we recommend doing the same dose. If you got the Pfizer for first one, get the Pfizer for second one. Same with the Moderna. Got it. 
So we'll have some keeping track. And I know that the state has been working on um, technology to make sure that we're doing our best to track that people get the information to get that second dose. And um, hopefully we're following up to make sure that that happens for everybody. To be mindful that though you may be protected against infection yourself, you could tr still transmit it to others until we get that data that might say otherwise. Yeah, and I think, so we had a question related to this on how do we know it's effective if you can still be a spreader? But I, I think what I'm hearing from you is that we know it's from, from these mass um, trials that we've done, we know that it's effective on the individuals, but we just weren't able to study how effective it is on the other end. So it doesn't affect the, effect, the efficacy for the individual who receives it, is that right? Yeah, so all that these trials really looked at so far was just whether a person got vaccinated developed kind of symptoms of COVID-19 infection, and not at all whether they might have been carrying the virus and potentially transmitting it to others. Got it. Thank you. So Dr. Svialli, back to you. Um, I know that, first of all, it's my understanding the vaccine is being made available at no charge to everyone in the U.S. Do I have that right? That's correct. Um, the government is paying for the vaccine. Um, there is a, a, a charge that people who administer the vaccine uh, can charge the insurance company. So uh, an individual will have no out-of-pocket costs and should not, nobody will ask, would ever ask you to pay money to, when you're going to get the vaccine. They may ask you for an insur your insurance information if you have insurance in order to bill the, your insurer that administration fee. Got it. So I heard I heard from your office this week that there are scams going around related to the vaccines and vaccine distribution. Can you talk a little about what people should be on the lookout for? Yeah, there, we, we are seeing, we've been seeing scams all throughout this pandemic of various kinds related to testing. Now the latest thing is vaccine. It's obviously a hot commodity. Everyone wants to get the vaccine and some scammers are taking advantage of that. So I would say um, if someone asks you to pay for the vaccine, that's a red flag that they're probably not legit. If someone's offering you uh, to cut in line, to, to get it before other people can. That's also a red flag if they're asking you to send cash or a gift card or a wire transfer and, and they'll ship the vaccine to you if they're offering to sell it to you on the internet. Those are all red flags that, um, that it's probably not legitimate and you're probably just wasting your money. Got it. Um, thank you for that. Um, and, and just to follow up, if you're wondering if a vaccine site is legit, you can always check our website. We will have a, a full listing of vaccination sites in the county uh, at coronavirus.cchealth.org forward slash vaccine. And we'll, we have a list of frequently asked questions there. And as we update our, our locations and times and days and who's eligible, everything will be found there. Perfect. So that's always, I mean, part of what, as I mentioned at the beginning of the Senator and I've worked so hard to do is make sure you know where the best information is available and the county is such a good source of that information. And for those that are um, tuning in from the Tri-Valley, uh, you can also check out Alameda County has similar information for your area. So, um, you know, please go on and check it out and make sure what you're getting is the real deal. That's really, really critical. Um, okay, I have a question from Michael Romano in Moraga about vaccine distribution as it relates to opening our schools. He is the parent of an adolescent, a 15 year old, um, and he, he understands that the Pfizer vaccine will only be available for those over 16. Is that right? Correct. I think as of now, the Pfizer vaccine is for uh, older than 16 and the Moderna vaccine is for older than 18. Uh, that may change over time as they, they are doing more studies on uh, younger population. And so they may extend that emergency use authorization to younger ages in the weeks and months to come. Okay, that's good to know. Because his concern was, you know, the studies on spread appear to show that a child who's 15 year old contracts it and spreads it similar to an adult. So how can we get those kids vaccinated so that our schools are safer? Yeah, we're hoping that it, that um, the vaccine will be available to as wide an audience as possible. 
Um, but luckily, the children themselves tend to have very robust immune responses and tend to have very few bad clinical outcomes. Um, I think the number of children who've died in California that are younger than 18 is still in the single digits for, for this entire pandemic. So even if the child themselves can get it and even transmit it, if the adults in their household have gotten the vaccine, then they should um, have at least some degree of comfort and protection. Got it. Okay, that is good to know. And then one question from um, Mordecai Rabinowitz, who asks about in-home support service workers. His understanding was that they were in tier two. Is that right? Um, they are in, you have to be careful with the tiers and the <laughs> phases. So they are in uh, phase 1A in tier two of phase 1A. So okay. those should be starting to be vaccinated um, probably about two weeks from now. So uh, I know we're working hard on, on setting that up and, uh, and that, that's coming quite soon, basically in the month of January, um, the, sometime in the month of January, they should be eligible. And the best place for those in-home support service workers to find that would be your website to keep track. And that's Correct. right. Okay. And then here's a, a, he asked a question about um, in-home support service workers, but generally as we get into these other tiers, what kind of proof are individuals going to have to show to prove that they're in the relevant tier? Um, in general, um, we believe people, we find that people have been very honest uh, throughout the pandemic in sharing their personal information. You, you, you know, if someone is uh, being deceitful, it happens, but, but it's actually rare. Most people are very ethical and, and, um, and honest about things. With, with age-based criteria, we will probably ask you for your date of birth. Uh, and possibly for an ID if you have it in order to prove that. Um, but in general, if, if you're someone, when we get to the phase of complex medical conditions and so forth, I think we will, we will uh, in general, trust people um, to be uh, transparent and, and not cut in line if it's not their turn yet. And I think, I think that's, a good policy. And I know that, like I said, you are working very hard to make sure that we are maximizing the lives saved by prioritizing those that need it most. So I know our community will step up and, and do the same. So thank you for that. Um, Senator Glazer, do you want to, I know you had a question for them. Thank you. Um, so there are a few people out there who might be thinking, um, uh, Dr. Savelli, uh, you know, vaccines are going to be available. You talked about within the next few weeks for different classes of people. So uh, things are on a pretty good track. Um, uh, so I can uh, go hang out with my friends. I can uh, you know, invite some people over for Christmas and, and New Year's. Uh, is, that, is there a reason to that the optimism should uh, reflect uh, our now behavior going forward? Not yet. Is this, I, I, I'm, I'm as tired of these restrictions as, as anyone. I, we just canceled a family gathering for the holidays and and um, my my wife's father was going to come visit us. He's staying away also. So the I, the transmission will take uh, relatively high. This is a very contagious virus. If people gather, if they uh, stop masking, if um, if they don't heed the warnings, uh, and we really need about. Um, we've run the numbers and we need about 60 to 70% of the population to get this vaccine in order to achieve what's called herd immunity, which is enough people resistant to the virus and hopefully also transmitting it less to, to reduce the risk. So even though we're all tired, we all have pandemic fatigue, we're all sick of our spouses and children and all of that, it's, it's, uh, it, this is the time to hold strong and, and, and um, maintain your vigilance for um, the next six to nine months. I think by summertime, by, uh, we, we should have a lot of people vaccinated and we, we, we should be starting to be able to breathe a sigh of relief. But for now, please maintain your vigilance. Thank you for that question, Senator. Um, you're welcome and thank you for your leadership. Um, so I, I wanna now ground, it, be, ground what you said because uh, you know, we all are tired and we are trying to figure out what plans we can make within you know, the next week, the next two weeks. Um, 
So I wanna be clear about uh, what this means in our regular daily life, these vaccinations now becoming available. For people who get the vaccination, so they're in the 1A or 1B category, which you indicate could be, uh, you know, you, uh, you could be in that space and get a vaccine in January, it does take two shots, right? From three to four weeks apart. It does, it, it, that's right. The Pfizer vaccine is recommended two shots, three weeks apart for the Moderna, it's four weeks apart. There is some immunity, some evidence that um, at least partial um, immunity after the first shot after about two weeks. But uh, we recommend maintaining your masking and distancing even after that time, because there's still so much that's unknown about the transmission issue, as Dr. Stanley said. Great. And so you have said that you think we're not going to get close to that herd immunity for six to nine months from today. Is that right? That's right. I'm, I'm uh, hopeful it's sooner, but um, the way it looks like the amount of vaccine doses that have been purchased by the government, uh, we, st we, we just know that there's not enough to get there for quite a while. And the incoming Surgeon General for the new administration has said something similar, that he thinks that uh, by the fall is the time that he thinks hopefully that they may get close to that, which will allow our kids to get back in school um, in, in next fall. Uh, but can you give us, can you ground us again uh, with, you know, I know a key issue uh, in the choices that the public health department has been making is the availability of excellent health care if someone does get the virus and needs care in our hospitals. Can you speak specifically now to the availability of hospital beds and ICU beds? And I know you're Contra Costa, so let me, let's speak to Contra Costa uh, right now and what you project for the future for the, the ability to get good care if you do get the virus. Yeah, thank you for that. That's one of the more worrisome aspects of where we are right now is um, the vaccine is coming, but before then we're actually, um, we're, we're setting records every day for the number of cases, the percent of people who test positive and number of people in the hospital. When we had our, our um, peak in the summer, we had 110 people in, in hospitals throughout the county with COVID-19. I just looked right before the session. As of today, we have 228 people in the hospitals. And in the Bay Area, our ICU capacity is now uh, less than 13%. Um, and it's, it's even worse in Southern California, in, in LA, in the Imperial Valley, in the Central Valley, they're down to no ICU capacity and they're, they're making decisions about limiting care and rationing care and giving treatment only to those who are most likely to benefit, which is something that we as physicians really hate doing. We really wanna give every patient the maximum amount of help and support they can, but when the, the hospitals fill up the way they have, it's really, really concerning. I know our, our um, healthcare workers and frontline staff are working so hard and they've been working really hard for months now. Um, so that's why it's so important to stay vigilant. We, we, we had the advice to stay vigilant for Thanksgiving and many people still gathered. And now we're seeing the sort of wave of cases and uh, deaths that are associated with that. And uh, we're really worried because it, in general, over the winter holidays, uh, you know, this long break, people gather even more than Thanksgiving. And so remember, we won't have that herd immunity for a number of months to come. So if you gather, you're really putting yourself at risk, you're putting your community members at risk. Even if you don't end up in the hospital, you may be giving it to someone who would or someone who would give it to their mother or um, or father who, who would end up in the hospital and potentially could die. So this is really the time to stay strong. To We all have a tendency to think it won't happen to me, but it is happening to many. And, uh, and um, there's no magical elixir. There's no magical protection. There, just because you love someone doesn't mean they don't have COVID and can't give it to you. So please, please, please. Uh, heed the advice, heed the order that uh, the state order that we're under to not gather. Um, if if you if you need to get out of the house, go outside um, and keep your mask on. The, the masks do work.
Thank you. And Assemblywoman, can I ask one last question on this track and then I'll defer of back course. to you. Um, so doctor, um, so the beds are filling up uh, in the hospitals and in ICU for COVID. So if someone gets a stroke or a heart attack, other things where they need services of emergency room, uh, emergency room there'll be beds for those people, won't there? Um, I, as of now, there are. And obviously, if you need medical care, we, we advise that you go get it. But I'm concerned that we may get so full that, um, that it will be hard to get the kind of care that people need. Even for anything else, uh, break your uh, ankle, uh, you think you have a stroke, uh, you, you feel like you might have a heart attack. Everything is in, in, at risk in our health system because of what we're facing right now. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Very, very worrisome. Thank you, Senator. Um, Dr. Stanley, we've had a bunch of questions come in for you on the vaccine and the trial. So let me direct some of these to you. Tom asks, in the vaccine trials, how are patients exposed to the COVID virus to know whether or not it is successful? Yeah, so that's that's a good question. Um, so the they're not um, in any way sort of um, in a lab or in a, a hospital setting exposed to the virus. They just go about their daily lives. And so they, um, you know, they contract the virus the way any of us might contract the virus. And um, so that's why these trials have to be so large. Um, you know, I think the Pfizer trial was 43,000 people. And I think they had around 180, you know, COVID positive cases um, in their placebo group, which means they didn't get the vaccine. And that's because we're not challenging people, you know, no one is challenging people with COVID intentionally to look at the efficacy of the vaccine. Got it. But when you compare that um, placebo group with the non-placebo group, that's when you see the efficacy? Exactly. That, yes. Okay. Uh, making sure I understand it. I'm not a scientist. <laughs> Uh, so Shrita asks a question about the spike protein you mentioned, and she says, if that's produced in our body, what happens to it and how does our get cleared from our body? Yeah. Um, so that's another great question. So, um, what happens is if we, if you get the protein given to you, or it's, um, you know, it's given to you in a way that your body produces it, um, none of these things are permanent and what ends up happening is kind of the normal processes of your body that will turn over your own cellular proteins um, will will degrade these proteins um, and they'll just be gone. Got it. So then let's talk about um, side effects, right? We've heard that from these vaccines may have potential side effects when you take it. Can you, can one of you, I don't know who the best person answer that is, but can one of you talk about that? Um, so um, I'll start by saying that um, we are not, we're seeing very, very, very few severe side effects. Um, I think um, I've heard of really single digit number of doses, number of cases of people having allergic reactions. And for the most part, those are people who have severe allergies to begin with. Um, we obviously don't know uh, long-term side effects because we need more time to study that and there's no way to accelerate that bit of knowledge. Um, but we do feel that uh, for the most part, people are not reporting. We're not seeing lots of reports of severe side effects. What we are hearing is that the vaccine is reactogenic, meaning you, it's very common actually to have a sore arm, and particularly with the second dose, some low grade fever or muscle aches, that doesn't mean you, you have uh, anything wrong. It doesn't mean you have COVID. This vaccine cannot give you COVID. Um, what it means is that your immune system is doing what it's supposed to do. It's seeing these uh, proteins being produced and uh, having an immune reaction to them, which uh, your body does. So it's doing what it's supposed to, but you can expect um, that, you know, especially after that second dose and maybe even after the first dose that you might not feel great for a couple of days and just plan around that. Um, there's some particular populations that we still don't know much about. Um, pregnant women, nursing mothers, uh, it takes time to get enough numbers to really get a sense of the safety uh, in subpopulations like that, I saw a question, someone uh, getting radiation uh, was asking, is it safe and effective with, for me? 
And I would say in the vast majority of cases, we think the benefit outweighs the harm. We think that um, the risk of getting COVID-19, getting sick with it, being potentially hospitalized with it, transmitting it is, um, is um, bigger than any uh, risk from the vaccine. So we really recommend, but, it, but, but for those subpopulations, we're really uh, recommending an individual decision depending on the setting in consultation with your personal doctor. Um, Dr. Stanley, I don't know if you have anything else to add on side effects. Yeah, I mean, I think that that was that was exactly what I would say. Um, and also, you know, in the clinical trials where they were monitoring people, there were very, very few adverse effects. And the ones that were reported were things like headache and fatigue. So it does seem like there are very few side effects from this vaccine, these vaccines. Right. So Joy did, so Joy asked for those who maybe had a stent placed recently or have other conditions. Oh. I'll add that the clinical trials had people of. Okay, Dr. Zilla, there's a little bit of a delay on your end. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, so, this is a question from Joy. I'll, I'll direct it to you, Dr. Stanley. Um, so, she's saying, should people seek medical advice from their own provider if they have pre existing conditions of some sort? And I assume the answer to that is yes, but I'll turn that to you. Yeah, definitely. I mean, always, you should always talk to your own doctor who knows you and, um, you know, seek advice from, from your physician if you have questions about your own personal health care. Right. Um, now, I don't think we have Dr. Svielli. Um The next question we had was actually about what, whether individuals will get an ID or something to carry um, when they are vaccinated. Do you know the answer to that, Dr. Stanley, or is that... I do not, but I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dr. Zielli's back. Did you hear the question? You're muted, but you're here. <laughs> Sorry, I'm back. My, my internet was acting up. Um, I heard the question about the ID. I didn't hear the one before that. But um, we, we are not anticipating giving anyone an ID, but we are creating these vaccination cards, just like uh, if you have children your kids got when they got their childhood vaccines. So we are anticipating that uh, they'll print one out for you and give it to you. The other thing which Assembly Member mentioned earlier is that um, the state has required that all vaccine doses go into the centralized state database within 24 hours of administration. So if, if you go back and you can't remember, did I get the Pfizer or the Moderna, it should be able to look, look you up and tell you what you got. Got it. Um, okay, a question from Tom that was breaking news. I read in the New York Times this morning um, that the virus might be mutating. Um, and I don't know how much we know about that, but if the virus is or does mutate, will this vaccine be effective? Dr. Stanley, you wanna take that? Sure, yeah. I mean, first of all, um, you know, I, I wanna say the virus has already mutated since, um, you know, its first emergence in, um, you know, in, in Wuhan in China. Um, and, um, you know, it seems like the mutations that the virus has um, acquired so far may make it may tra more transmissible but don't seem to make it more virulent um, or, or, you know, or more sort of deadly. So that's really good news. Um, and the other good news is that the variants that are emerging seem like they will still be covered by the virus. So right now there's not really a concern, I mean, by the, the vaccine. vaccine. <laughs> um, yeah, so right now there's not really a concern that any of the, you know, the known variants that seem to be emerging um, will not be covered by the vaccine. Got it. Um, that's good to know. Brings a little bit of comfort in that news today. Um, Dr. Svile, a question we've gotten this a couple times now from Rossmore residents. Given that most, all Rossmore residents are over, I believe, 55, but most are over 65, is there any chance that the county would set up a vaccination site there in Rossmore when it's time for the over 75 population and others to get it? Absolutely, we're looking at options over there. I'm, I'm hoping that we'll be able to do that or partner with John Muir to do that or one of our other partners. Great, I know they would appreciate that. So thank you. Um, and then we had someone who wanted to loop back to what you had said about the allergies um, that had caused some pretty severe reactions. Were there specific allergies that have been noted to have caused reactions that you know of? 
No, um, and every every site that vaccinates does carry um, all the medical supplies to respond to a severe aller allergic reaction. I just want to reassure people of that, and the FDA has mandated that, and we're making sure that all our vaccine sites have that. No, the, the allergies, um, the only real contraindication is if you're allergic to one of the ingredients in the vaccine, and the ingredients are things that are quite rare. So when you come to get the vaccine or even beforehand, you can look it up online. You can see what are the ingredients of the Moderna vaccine or the Pfizer vaccine. And if you, but, but it, it would be quite a rare situation when you're allergic to one of those ingredients. There are people that seem to be, to have more severe allergies, either food allergies, um, or they've had an anaphylactic reaction in the past and they carry an EpiPen or something like that. Those people should be a little more cautious and probably be observed. The, our standard observation window after a vaccine is 15 minutes. So those people should probably be observed more like 30 minutes. Um, but again, we expect those reactions to be quite, quite rare. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and Dr. Stanley, this question is for you. If someone has already had COVID, will the vaccine work or do they already have the immunity? What do we know about that? Yeah, um, I, I think what I can say about that is that we have good reason to believe that if you've had COVID already, you have really, you know, you probably have good immunity to getting it again. Um, what we know about the vaccine in terms of the immune response is that if you compare sort of the levels of antibody and the amount, the strength of the immune response that the vaccine um, induces, it's pretty similar in magnitude to what people who got COVID-19 naturally um, have as well. So it really does seem like what the vaccine is doing is really mimicking, you know, the course of a normal sort of if you got COVID-19 and you generated a protective immune response, the vaccine is doing that for you without um, you having had to get have COVID-19. Got it, thank you. Um, here's a question, Dr. Sfielli, about, you know, people have read about the proper temperature, right? For both vaccines, they're different, but they have to be kept cold and super cold. Um, how, will they, how will we know that the vaccine that we're receiving hasn't been compromised during transit? Yeah, that's like half my time is spent on what we called cold chain management. So we've made sure that uh, we have these ultra low uh, temperature freezers in the county. And actually part of why our county got a lot of the Pfizer vaccine early is because we bought some of these freezers in the early days knowing this might happen and we had more freezers than some other places. Um, we have uh, each batch of vaccine has is assigned a, a person, a cold chain manager, who's basically in charge of tracking what temperature was the batch of vaccine throughout its transportation from one place to the next. All the refrigerators and freezers have temperature logs that automatically alert if something's wrong. And so that's a huge part of our operation and of the complexity and uh, making sure that uh, the the vaccine has not been compromised. For example, the Pfizer vaccine, once it's out of the deep freeze, even in the fridge, you have to give it within five days. So we're, we're really, a lot of our logistics are, when do we take it out so that it stays good? And the Moderna vaccine has a little more flexibility. You can have it in the fridge for up to 30 days. Um, so it's a little easier to work with, but we, you can rest assured that there, that's one of, like we do not want to waste a single, dose of vaccine. As a matter of fact, we've told all our vaccination sites, if you open up a, a, a multi-dose vial, the last one of the day, and they each have five doses in them, if you only have two people left on your list, find three other people and give them those last three doses. We're, we're really tracking it down to the dose and reporting all of it back to the state and the federal government. That's great to know. Thank you for all that hard work. Um, so, Here's a question about safety. So we did these trials, they were found to be safe and effective, and now we're giving it to people in the community. Are we tracking the safety and efficacy for those individuals or are we done tracking that now that the trial is done? Yes, we're, we're continuing to track and actually we, we but like if you're not getting your vaccine for three months, there should be a lot more data by then because millions of people will be getting it in the interim. So we'll, 
we'll have a lot of data in fairly short order. Uh, where any severe effects are reported through the same national vaccine adverse effect system that we use for all vaccines. And in addition, the manufacturers have come up with an app called VSAFE. And when you get the vaccine, you'll get, be getting a set of instructions of how to download it on your phone. And it will send you text messages and ask you, are you having side effects? And so we recommend uh, that people download that and report any adverse effects, even if they're mild, just so that we know what percentage of people have a sore arm or a low grade fever or muscle aches. So that's, that's very much of interest to all of the doctors and scientists we want to we always want to know about side effects. We don't want to uh, give false advertising and say something is safe when it isn't. So we uh, we are keenly interested in that and there'll be lots of tracking of that. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Stanley, a question for you. So somebody says we studied this on a minimum age, right? 16 or 18, depending on the vaccine. But what about weight? This is a 22 year old who is under hundred pounds and wants to know is it safe for her? You know, that's a good question. And, and I actually do not know the answer to what the criteria were for enrolling in the, in the clinical trials. I will say um, that what I know as an immunologist is that um, there are differences in immune responses in children and adults. Um, and so sometimes, um, you know, infectious diseases and vaccines work differently in children than in adults. Um, if you're an adult, even if you're a very small adult, um, you're likely to respond um, immunologically more similar to, you know, to other adults. But I, I don't know, maybe Dr. Svieli knows the answer to that question um, better than I do. Um, I have not seen a weight restriction on the vaccine or alternate dose for either low weight or high weight. So um, for now, I think it's a one dose uh, vaccine and I think it's gonna be, um, if I hear anything else, we'll, we'll let you know. But I, I don't think it was in the FDA emergency use authorization. Got it, interesting. Um, okay, so we're almost out of time. So I have last two questions. One is somebody asked, will I get to choose which vaccine I get, the Moderna or the Pfizer or a future approved vaccine? Daly? Um, probably not in the early days because there won't be enough. So certain sites will just have one or the other. I suspect that um, eight, nine months from now, it could be that many places will have the option. But, um, but my guess is the first time you become eligible, you'll probably have to um, take what is available. Uh, the good news about both of the vaccines that are approved so far is they both have quite good efficacy and side effect profile. So they're both fairly equivalent, I would say. Um, so if you had to ask me, which one would you take? I would say whichever one I could get first. Love that, thank you. So last question. Um, Joyce asked first, what documentation do you need to show that you're in a specific tier? And Joyce, we did cover that. They're gonna trust you. Um, so unless that changes, that's the answer now. But she also asks, how do I get in line for the vaccine when it's my turn? Do I have to make an appointment? So Dr. Svieli, is it going to look like the testing where we go online and we make an appointment or how do you anticipate this will go? Um, I think it will be, um, there will probably be a combination of both. So the, uh, almost certainly uh, it will be by appointment at certain sites and you can do it online or by phone. Uh, we may have mass vaccination days where we, you know, we find a site that can tolerate, can, can accept a lot of cars, a giant parking lot somewhere and have people line up and show up even day of. But that doesn't work quite as well because we need your name, date of birth, um, insurance information. We don't want someone sort of backing up the whole line. So in general, it's much, much better if you can pre-register, get an appointment time. You can get in and out, out more quickly. Um, so it will. there will probably be a combination, but it will be most effective if you sign up ahead of time. And just keep checking our website for the sign up. We'll also do media outreach once we're ready for people to sign up. We'll, we'll, we'll get on the radio and on the TV and on the web and, 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 and try to get as many people vaccinated. Our goal is to get as many people vaccinated in the county as, as we can in the fastest amount of time. 
Awesome. Well, and I know that I speak for myself and um, I'm sure also the Senator that we will be working to get the word out as well as it becomes more widely available. We will, we want to get to herd immunity It is what is going to bring us back to normalcy. So we'll do our best to communicate with all of you as well um, to make sure you know when, when it's time for the general public to get that vaccine. So thank you both. That's all the time we have, but this has been so informative. We weren't able to answer all the questions and I apologize. There were just too many, um, but hopefully you got some really, I know I learned a lot tonight about vaccine and how they will be distributed and, um, and feel, feel good about um, the testing. So thank you both Dr. Stanley and Dr. Sfielli for being here today and providing us with the best information. And so you heard Senator Glazer and Dr. Sfielli talk about the current state of things in our community. And so although this is the silver, this is the bright spot in where we are right now, we also need to remember that the community spread is very high right now and our hospitalization rates are very high and capacity in our hospitals is very low. And so it is incumbent upon us, even though I know this isn't how we wanna spend the holidays, to do our best to keep the spread low, which means wearing your mask at all times when with people outside of your household, to please keep your physical distance as much as possible and do your part to help slow the spread and save lives. There aren't many times in our life when we have a chance to save lives and you have that chance right now. So please do your part by wearing your mask, washing your hands and keeping your physical distance. And hopefully we see the light at the end of this tunnel in the spring when we will be vaccinated and we will get back to life as we remember it. My family just finished Hanukkah um, and it was the first time where we've done it every night, just my little family, but it ended up being sweet and it was the best thing for the community. So I hope you will do the same. Um, thank you all. And please, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to me or to Senator Glazer if you need any assistance. We are here to support you. If you need help with unemployment, with the DMV, with any state agency, if you have any questions, please, please call us. We are here to support the community and make sure that we get through this pandemic as smoothly as possible. So you can reach me at 925-328-1515 or you can find my website online for my email address. Thanks for joining us and I hope this has been informative and helpful.